Uh, I'm John Murray. I work in the data strategy team at uh, GB Group. Um, I've been there since last November. Prior to that, uh, I've been around this industry for 30 years doing data analysis, firstly in Fortran, first staff member. I was one of SAS's first customers in the UK. Um, just a little bit about what I do in my day job. Well, GB Group, we're identity specialists. So we bring together data from different data sets with our own proprietary technology, matching and predictive analytics, and we build databases that then allow our clients to sort of, uh, prevent fraud, locate people, etc. So the uh, kind of thing might be tracing debtors, uh, etc. Um, outside of my day job, I'm an occasional visiting lecturer at the University of Chester. I teach the MSc uh, multi-dimensional database course, amongst other things. Um, I also did a project around open data with the University of Chester. Um, we got some European regional development funding to run a series of workshops for small businesses on a variety of subjects. And two of those uh, have been very successful. The whole day workshops that include um, practical sessions. And um, these were provided free to businesses using the EU funding. But I did one on an introduction to open data, but actually then letting them get their hands on uh, some open data and what they can do with it. Um, so, for example, um, an example I gave earlier, which is uh, it's actually a friend of mine, runs a little delicatessen just around the corner from my house. How can she use open data? Well, she um, has a customer database. She's collected the uh, names and addresses and email addresses of her, of her customers. So what I was able to show her was just uh, for a small local area, she was looking to introduce a delivery service, was to go to neighborhood statistics, the ONS site, just get the localized uh, profiles from the census, and then to take also the same data output area level and look how her customers' postcodes match to that data. So then I compared the profile of the whole area, her roughly three mile radius for her delivery, with the profile of her customers and found, not surprisingly, it was more book market, 30 to 45 professionals, and that's purely the census data. So it's just as much use to SMEs as it is to big businesses, but I think that's an education or exercise also run a workshop called Putting Your Business on the Map, which is an introduction to uh, GIS using open source, um, the quantum GIS system. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is joining data together. So why do we join data together? Because in itself, a data set, yes, it's got some value, there's some value that can be derived from it, but when you start joining, data from disparate sources together, you get some quite really powerful correlation effects. So to achieve the maximum benefit, you need to join it. So the example I just gave you, appending socio-demographic data to a marketing database for in to, great, to gain insights. So that will be typically at postcode level. Merging crime data with benefits and deprivation data to look at causes, underlying causes of crime. This is actually one I did. Uh, we're all PCT, uh, joining uh, NHS data and prescribing data to census data to look at factors underlying poor health. And geography, this is the main message I want to bring across today, is that Geography is the common currency in much open data. So location, whatever it is, even though it might not be obvious how it's location-based, there is often some locational element, and that allows us to join data sets together. So what geography types do you get? Well, census data, it has I'll talk more about that in a minute. That uh, has a hierarchy, it has output areas, typically, and um, I'll talk more about the hierarchy. You've got administrative geographies, so that's local authorities, regions, police, NHS, uh, etc. Political geography, 
you've got electoral wards, parliamentary constituencies, they don't all quite align. So you've just got to be a little bit careful of the... They do approximately, but you need to understand how that works. And then you've got postal geography, the humble postcode, which has become... People use it, you put it into your sat-nav where you're going. Um, it's become the, uh, uh, it's geodemographic tools like Experience Mosaic rely on postcodes. Um, there's also unstructured geography. It has no structure. It's just a point. Something happened at this point. There's also bespoke catchments. So if you're a retailer, you might have catchment areas that uh, describe your retail stores. So we'll talk a bit about census geography. It's, census, is, census geography is a hierarchy of published area statistics. When the census is collected, it is aggregated and published at various levels of geography. So you'll get typically either counts, counts and uh, percentages at different levels of geography. Now the smallest unit it's published at is an output area. And that is typically 40, that's 40 to 250 households is the range. The guidance from ONS is 125 is the optimal but they are deliberately chosen for homogeneity. So that when you do, because the local authorities, health authorities are using this data to plan services, they need to know that it's reasonably accurate and reliable. So they're not just arbitrary boundaries, they are chosen deliberately. Uh, lower super output area is a larger base. It's an aggregate of output areas and typically that's 400 to 1,200 households, recommended is 600. And then you've got this middle super output area, which is even higher, that's a 2,000 to 6,000 households, that will typically cover, but not exactly, they don't align exactly, that's about the size of an electoral, electoral ward uh, in, in a local authority. And recommendation there is about 4,000. So it does link to administrative geography, but as I say, it just doesn't exactly. So this is where you need to be careful. So you, the ONS publish two data geography tables. The most common one, and the one I recommend you using if you're in business, is the ONS postcode directory, ONSPD. Just Google it, it's freely downloadable. It, consists of, it has every postcode in the UK, both pa uh, past and present, so there are about 2.7 million postcode entries, and for each postcode it gives you the, um, uh, an output area code, a lower super output area code, middle super, it gives you the local authorities, uh, gives you the electoral ward, gives you the parliamentary constituencies, gives you the NHS districts. Now. There's also another table which is very similar. It's called the National Statistics Postcode Lookup Table. That's freely downloadable as well. And, and they are very similar. The data format is virtually identical. However, there is one difference between the two. The National uh, the ONS Postcode Directory is what's called snapped to postal ge geography. So if a postcode straddles a boundary, it will be snapped to the one that it's in the largest, the most in. So, whereas the National Statistics Lookup doesn't do that, it will, it will tell you that it spans. And similarly, where output areas span um, um, administrative boundaries, in the ONSPD they're snapped to largest, in the NSPL they're not. So, th there are some very good user guides on on there and it does explain, the ONS website does explain very well when to use, but I would say my advice is in business use ONSPD, if you're working in a local authority you probably want to consider NSPL. So, administrative and political geography, so we've got local authorities, districts, uh, counties, 
metropolitan boroughs, unitary councils, even parish and town councils. They're all in the ONSPD. Parliamentary constituencies, government regions, they're all there. NHS commissioning regions, police forces, they're not, a, it doesn't give a police force in ONSPD, but you can download, download that from uh, data.police.uk. So you can, it's free, they're all freely available as open data. And recently, the Environment Agency, you've just published your flood data. It's a big announcement, wasn't it? The flood risk zones. It's just a matter of Is this the whole of the UK or just England? It's England and Wales. So not Scotland? Not Scotland, yeah. So, is it for Scotland? Oh, the ONSPD does cover Scotland. Right. Okay. Uh, they, they, do, uh, they do cover, because Scotland has different terms. It basically, output areas and data zones. They, just, okay. they call it a data zone. It's the same kind of thing. But yes, it, it the ONSPD covers Scotland. Covers Scotland. So, at the moment. At the moment. At the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you have Don't to... get into that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go to the Scottish census site to get the actual data for Scotland, but it actually also has Northern Ireland in there as well. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and so the links are provided in ONSPD and NSPL. So, so postal geography. We all love our postcodes. We've got addicted to them. So it's based around the postcode, it's introduced 1959 on a trial basis. Current system has been in use since 1967. Uh, it's, it's not designed for demographic analysis. It is designed to deliver mail. And, and uh, so therefore it does not conform to, to any other type of boundaries. It's purely for the raw mail's convenience. So I mean, we have, I live in Chester, which is right on the Welsh border. We have postcodes that straddle England and Wales. Imagine that. I hope there are some that straddle England and Scotland. What's going to happen to them? Anyway, um, so it doesn't align with administrative geography at all. However, it, it generally, for most purposes, because they're quite small, it's okay. So that's the key message. Um, there are currently 1.8 million postcodes currently in use, but the ONSPD has got retired ones. Um, so, you, so if you get some, you've got some old data you want to match, you can still match it. Um, the mean number of the Royal Mail refers to them as delivery points because they might be businesses and they might be houses. So they say the mean number of delivery points in a postcode is 14. Is it still on trial as it started in 1959? It was just a small trial uh, in Norwich originally. Um, if anyone wonders why, uh, it, was then, it was tried in Norwich and uh, Croydon. If anyone wonders why the main Croydon postcode is CR0, it's because when they first started them, they used three letter acronyms and it was CRO for Croydon, but they changed it to CR0. Mm. So that's a bit of a useless fact. <laughs> right. This is an anatomy of a postcode. It does have various elements. So that's our postcode of a GB group. We have our own, um, which you can do. A lot of companies generally, we, you can get your own postcode. So it's CH49 GB. But the actual anatomy of that is CH. That's the postcode area. That's Chester. CH4, that's the postcode district. And you often see these referred to. I mean, you do see data published at these. Are. For example, DVLA open data is published at postcode district level. So you can um, DVLA publish um, driving licenses. So you can see, um, I did a map recently um, where I took the DVLA points data, driving license points. Who's, which area of the country has got most points on their license uh, as a proportion of drivers? And it's actually, it's actually a rural issue, people with, because there's more chance to speed, I suspect, than people in the city. Yeah. Yeah. But I also, I also think another factor is there's some areas that, that stood out and thought why. So maybe because the police are more enforcing it. 
and that might be the reason. Um, but DBLA published driving license points, so the number of points, it's a cross tab, number of points across one across the top, postcode um, district down the side, so like CH1, CH2, and you'll have a, a count for each number of points. Now, I think the maximum number of points someone has, and it's in the Liverpool postcode, is 43. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, a Freedom of Information Act request on that was done recently by one of the newspapers when this data was published, and it's actually for failure to disclose name driver. That's why it's got four. I, I, he's still driving, but he's aggregated 43 points as a businessman, apparently, who failed to say, oh, this, this person was driving when it got flashed by a speed camera. Right. Um, so CH4 and first digit is called a postcode sector. Now they're a homogenous unit and it's around 2,500 households. Postcode sectors are often used for distributing, are used as a mechanism for distributing door-to-door -door literature. So you know those annoying things the postman puts through your door. Well they are actually targeted, but they're targeted demographically at, at uh, postcode sector level typically. Um, no, newspapers use them for advertising, typically broadcast media use postcode sectors as a unit of, an, of aggregation. And CH49GB is the full postcode. The actual last two digits specify the postman's walk. So that's actually what it's called, the walk. Some of you who are into addressing systems might have heard the term walk sort or seen it on, on envelopes. It's, it's actually about pre-sorting mail when you post it so that it, it is less work for the raw mail and then you get a discount. Right, GB is called the walk. CH4 is often called the outcode because in a sorting office that's its routing outwards. And 9GB is often referred to as the encode because when it comes into the sorting office that's where it's split into the sector and the walk. So it's an allocated to postman to take out. So some postcode facts, postcode mean 14, sector 2530, postcode district mean 9080. So the postcode area, which is the first bit, is about 200,000. 26 million delivery points in the UK. So then we're coming on to some location. Ordnance survey code point. Open, which is a, a great data set, it's fantastic, it's free, it's updated quarterly. You've got the ONSPD and the NSPL contain grid references for what we what is termed the postcode centroid. Now the postcode centroid is if you imagine a center, it's sort of an area, it's, it's roughly in the middle of that shape, however it's always snapped to the nearest house or, or delivery point so that it, it will not be quite in the geometric centre, it will be put to the, um, to the nearest house, to the centre. And that's what I use for predominantly for joining a lot of data sets together. So as I said earlier, my view is in most cases if you're looking to join data, use ONSPD. You can, if you've got a customer database and you want to append uh, some demographic data to it, then if you look up the postcode in the ONSPD and then get the corresponding census data from the lookup there, you can then append demographic data to your customer database or any other data that you want that's published at that level. Yeah, although it's approximate, because I say it's snapped, it's good enough for most uses, because in most cases it conforms exactly, there are only a few near the boundaries, and because it's a fairly small unit, you're talking two or three households different. Um, I say if you're in public, political or the public sector, then I would consider using the NSPL as an alternative. Uh, specifically designed for that purpose. But use postcode to join data. So you can also join individual and household data. So you've got a customer database that you require, you've got uh, it structured in such a way that it gives you household view and individual view, then you can use a postcode to join that to other data sources. So it doesn't all have to be open data. You can use this mechanism to join your own data to open data or join any commercial, if you're buying in commercial data, you can bring that in 
and you can bring that all into the mix. So another thing is that to say, augmenting existing data, for example, the customer database, enriching it with additional information that you might use for insights, uh, store planning, so if you're opening a new retail store, you know what your customers look like, you know their profile, so you can then go into the census and look for um, other parts of the country with a similar demographic profile, so you might well put a store there. So customer demographic profiling, store catchment analysis, you can join open and closed data sets, and it's common to many open data sources, links to other geography. Right, so here's an example of some point data. The, the, what I did here, a very simple example of joining data, is these little red dots. They're all GP surgeries. I took the NHS um, GP surgery data, joined it to Oak Ordnance Survey code point to get the centroid of the post. It's, it's roughly right, it won't be quite right, but probably somewhere like a GP surgery because it's going to get such a, a large volume of mail, it's probably going to have its own postcode unique to it because businesses that receive large volumes are what's called large users. So these are, these are GP surgeries, as you see, or the actual location of a GP surgery throughout the uh, northwest. That's just one example. So geospatial, to me the way to really exploit it is to use a database. And modern databases now uh, have extensions for spatial data types. So you've got point point is a very simply a single point in space. It, it's a coordinate. It just defines a position on the planet's surface. Line is a set of join points. So an example would be a road, canal, railway. Um, and a polygon is a closed set of joined points. So that might be uh, a local authority boundary, um, any kind of bounding data, it might be a natural feature like a lake. So most databases support spatial data types, so the proprietary ones, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, they support now these types of point, line, polygon, and you can index them. Um, open source. I must admit, this MariaDB become my favorite per personal favorite database. It is a fork of MySQL, and it, was, it has been spun off by uh, Facebook, Intel, and Google. Google migrated all their MySQL systems to it last September. One of the advantages of it, well, one, it's very fast. It is a lot faster than MySQL. The other is, it's a hybrid database. You might have heard the term NoSQL. <coughs> yeah not only SQL. Well, it's a hybrid database. It's SQL and NoSQL. So it's legacy, so it will handle MySQL databases, but you can also do dynamic databases in it. So that hybrid approach is companies that are looking to migrate. This is a problem for companies with big data uh, coming along, that you've got unstructured data. Uh, MariaDB offers an opportunity to have unstructured and structured alongside, and it's free, and it's open source. Uh, post, post um, there's some uh, NoSQL Neo4j, which is a graph database, uh, and MongoDB, which I quite like. It uh, stores JSON documents and indexes them. So um, Neo4j is like a social network. I mean, again, this this uh, talk is normally I'm trying to cram two-day workshop into 45 minutes. So <laughs> apologies. Um, uh, further reading on the internet, um, and I will if we run the workshops again, they are free, um, I'll, I will publicise that on my Twitter. So spatial queries, what kind of things can you do with spatial data types? Well, that's a useful one, is a point in a polygon. So we've got a point, a data point, right? Maybe it, it could be caught from a phone app. So it's hit the satellite, it says, I'm here, where am I? So we know, ah, you're in this local authority area, because 
the pointing polygon query to the database will say, you're in, uh, are we in City of Westminster here? Yeah, we're you're in City of Westminster. Um, so that kind of thing is, is Facebook does it. Facebook, when it says your location, it says from wherever you are at the moment. And it, that is a simple example of a pointing <coughs> polygon query. Um, intercepts, crosses. So that's quite a useful one. So where you've got roads and boundaries, is this road in um, is this road in a in a boundary? Um, a useful set of boundaries actually is there's the Ordnance Survey in what they call their Meridian product has got what they call DLUAs, they're developed land urban areas. And that is the definition of an urban area, so built up areas. So if you were to put, join, intersect roads to built up areas, um, it's actually quite useful to say what roads, so you can work out roughly speed limits where they will be in uh, difference between urban driving and rural driving. So when, if you were doing a drive time type application, that's a bit useful to join in those data sets. I'll show you an example of that a bit later on. So distance is another spatial query, but it's not yet supported by all the databases. So that's how far is something from something, uh, something else. So where's my nearest? Okay. And here's an example, it's probably not, it's not showing up well on the side, but these are local authority districts, boundaries. Now these are from Ordnance Survey Open Data. Um, they're also, you can get them from ONS as well, so you've got, you've got two sources of the same thing, basically. But that's an example, that is stored as a polygon. So that's, that's Cheshire West and Chester, which is our local authority. Uh, there's Wirral, there's City of Liverpool. Um, they, they use, well, you can actually, if you store the underlying polygon data in a database with a spatial data type, draft, uh, maps is just a way of visualizing, you can say, where's this point? And, and it will return the results. So point in polygon, that's how it works. Uh, distance metrics, talked about distance. Now, Euclidean distance sounds very posh. It's basically, you might remember Pythagoras' theorem, those who did maths at school. Well, it's a crow flies linear distance of two points, so it's the, it's the direct distance. Um, you've got a graph distance, which is actually the graph distance is actually takes networks into account. So that will be the road or rail distance from one point to another. So example, road distance. Manhattan distance, it's a, you might think it's not an obvious one, it's a rectilinear distance. And essentially what it is is two, the other two sides of the triangle. So if you think about it in Manhattan, you've got a grid, grid system. So is it any quicker to do that through Manhattan than to go like that? No, it isn't actually, although psychologically you might think it is. It's actually the same distance. And Manhattan distance is quite a useful thing to restrain queries, because if you're doing a find my nearest, I'll show you a problem with Euclidean distance in a minute. Uh, another one I should just briefly touch on, which is what Google Earth uses, is great circle distance. And that's the shortest distance between two points on the surface of a sphere. But it isn't exactly a straight line. So you have to remember the Earth isn't flat. <laughs> <laughs> so very briefly, some elementary maths, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. It's basically that the sum of the squares of the um, opposite and the adjacent equals the square of the hypotenuse of the triangle. And that's how you can calculate the uh, crow flies distance. So Paul, that is a massive overhead on a query, because that's doing quite a complex floating point query, and if you've got a large database, that's going to take some time. Using a Manhattan distance, you can just make it integers, and you can use that as a constraint to get a sub-query, and then just do the Euclidean distance on the result set. So that's a problem. Okay, another problem. Problem with Euclidean distance. 
Uh, where I live in Chester, the uh, Liverpool Airport, you can see there, to the top of the uh, map, put up a poster campaign around the city saying, Liverpool Airport, oh, less than 10 miles from Chester. Which is it. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not incorrect. And the poster sites all over the city. The Advertising Standards Authority came down on them like a ton of bricks, saying it was misleading. Because you've either got to go to the bridge, or you go further up here and you go to the tunnel. Unless you can, unless very low tide you can walk across. But there's a good way to do it. Do they have to change the poster to say um, 10 UK <laughs> No, they took them down. Um, but the, the graph distance, the fastest, is, is the, oops, sorry, that's the wrong button there. The graph distance is the, basically the M56 motorway for most of the way. Um, that's the fastest. Now, graph distance, I've used, or I use an open data data set, Ordnance Survey Strategy, which is one of their data sets, and there's a road data set within that. So that's your strategy with an I, strategy I. Uh, I think that's the spell check that's check corrected that for me. Um, but the roads database, the roads data set in there, it gives you a set of nodes to where the junctions are and then the distances between them. Now if you want shortest, there are two algorithms. Uh, one's called Gistra's algorithm, D-I-G-A. Um, you find it on Google or it's an improvement of it called the A-star algorithm, which you can find on Wikipedia and other places, which calculate the shortest route between two points on a network. And, and they're very useful for drive time type applications. Now, we were wanting to, because I had a client who was complaining about people being sent to, I mean, I go on Weatherspoon's website or uh, customer, uh, commonly, or Tesco, and I put in my Chester postcode and I get told my third nearest branch is in Liverpool, which it isn't really, but as the crow flies it is. Now if you use um, a drive time algorithm, it's, it, it, you can get around that. However, there's a big overhead on the If you use a GIS system like MapInfo, MapPoint, Google Maps, you probably know it takes quite a few seconds to calculate the distance. So what I've done there is I've actually calculated a batch created a batch engine with open data that can do about 10,000 drive times a second. So that can batch drive time a database. So you can put a set of uh, postcodes in it, you can put a set of your outlets in it, and it will calculate the nearest, and with all UK postcodes, it can do it in about two hours. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that I've developed around that, and again, using entirely open data. Um, if you want, the, the, the difference is if you want to change the way you change the algorithm for fastest or shortest is that by default it's shortest because in the data set it tells you the uh, distance in uh, meters actually between the two nodes. So that's a that, if you optimize that, that will give you the shortest distance. If you change that to a time in seconds that it would take to drive that section at, say, the normal speed and speed limit for that road, it doesn't give you those. That's why, I'm, that's why I said earlier that it's quite useful to be able to, it gives, tells you the road type, whether it's a, a road, primary A road, tells you whether it's a road, but then if you start matching them to towns, you can assume that if it's in an urban area, it's going to be 30 and things like that, so you can actually get a bit more accurate um, on it. <coughs> I mean, Google, Google actually uses real-time information because they're getting that back all the time. Um, but that's a, it's a useful data set. And so if you just change the distance to a time, you, it, it just calculates fastest. So just talk non, so non-formal, unstructured geography. So what can you use it for? Micro. Uh, it's a pity Jackie's gone. We're sort of talking about, to, about this to her earlier. A lot of my work is around micro geocentric analysis. So what's the area around, like you, around you like? How can we describe it? So describe a neighborhood. Point-based data. So relate 
you can relate that to formal geographies through boundaries. So if you have your boundaries stored in a database, you can do the point in polygon, and you can then relate it to a formal geography. Uh, user defined, so you might have a store catchment. Again, you probably uh, again store that, try and store that in a database as a boundary, and then you can relate your other um, the queries to relate that to your other geographies to match data. Uh, sales territories against a similar type thing. Uh, radial and drive time. So you might say, for example, a lot of um, I've done quite a lot of drive time analysis, uh, particularly. Um, how far are people willing to drive to um, your nearest branch? Now that does vary whether it's a city branch or whether it's a rural, as we were saying over lunch, uh, but it's um, radial and drive time analysis it, it, is certainly in the retail sector it's quite important. So you might have drive time zones, so 15 minutes drive time zone, 30, 35, and store those in your database. Um, Point-based data, simpler, just a, a little touch on this, I don't really want to go into too much technical detail, but just, it's the simplest type of spatial object that represents a point relative to the Earth's surface. It usually, in most cases, in the kind of data we're dealing with, it has two coordinates, although in some OS data, it has three coordinates because it has the altitude, as I said. Uh, Ordnance survey grid references are, which you're familiar with, they're Cartesian coordinates, so they're the old XY coordinates, and there's some arbitrary point just off the Isles of Scilly, which is north north, and it's meters north and meters east of that origin point. Now, a point to bear in mind is that uh, different countries have different origins for their uh, systems. Now, in ONSPD, this is a mistake a lot of people make, go and try Tesco's website and put in a Chester postcode and you get told the nearest branch is in Belfast. The reason for that is that they haven't taken into account the fact that the Irish national grid has a different origin and just happens to be that the postcodes, uh, the coordinates are very similar. And, and gov.uk, until recently, if you put in a... Um, Belfast postcode, it told you your local authority was either Wirral or Cheshire West and Chester. <laughs> so, um, so it's not just, and Weatherspoons have the same problem, Boots do, it's a really common problem. So if you're actually working with ONSPD, any postcode that begins BT has a different origin. So don't try and do district metrics between the two, you need to do a conversion. Right, okay. Converting between systems. Now, uh, GIS software or conversion software, because if you're probably familiar with Google Earth, uh, uses longitude and latitude, which is a different type of system, because all the survey grid references assume the Earth is flat, and it's actually just a flat approximation of a small part of the Earth, really. Um, but if you're going to do anything over larger areas, you need to convert to and from longitude and latitude. Um, so you use GIS software to convert. There are some conversions freely done. Ordnance Survey has got some freely downloadable Excel spreadsheets and other scripts. It's, uh, but they've got a, a, a load of literature. They've got some very comprehensive user guides to, to writing your own conversion scripts if you want to convert between geography types. Um, unfortunately, it isn't quite as straightforward as just using a simple formula because the Ordnance Survey uh, grid references date from 1830. There were a few historic inaccuracies in the surveying originally. And there's also, the UK has moved, tectonic shift. And there's also been some compression of coasts. So Ordnance Survey have an open data database that gives you for every kilometre square in the country, the movement at each, quarter, uh, at each uh, corner point since 1830. And you need to use that if you're going to convert to and from. Uh, and they give you all the methods and the formulae. Um, my house has moved about 176 metres since it was built in 1881, I reckon. So, um, wow. Yeah. It's quite a bit because it, the UK has apparently rotated and moved south. So it's more, much more pronounced if you live in Kent or the tip of Scotland. 
Back to that subject. Yes. <laughs> so is France How receding away from this? Disappear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so as a OS provide a data set, and you can actually do that with um, geocentric analysis. I do all this. Use a point as a centre. And then radiate out. I use the Euclidean distance to radiate out to see what's around me. However, I do use the Manhattan distance to constrain that query so that I don't pull too much, otherwise, I'm doing quite a heavy overhead on the server. Um, so I use the Euclidean distance to aggregate, aggregate metrics. I'll show you some examples of these. These standardized units is important. An example population density at postcode level. So I took a census data set, which is at postcode level, it's called uh, postcode estimates. It's got the count of households and then population total and males and females for each postcode in the UK on census map. So joined it to Ordnance Survey code point open, join them, sum the counts within a specified radius and convert it to a standardized unit, so I convert it to people per hectare. Because I know from pi r squared, what the radius of my circle is at that point, so I know how many people I've got, I can standardize the unit, so I can do a meaningful <coughs> comparison at different levels. I'll show you that. That is how Chester looks. Uh, each one of those dots is a postcode centroid. So this is much more granular than census data because it's actually an individual postcode. And what it does is it shows you in some of these districts little pockets which census data wouldn't show you because it's not granular enough. It, its output areas are, are larger. So you get some little pockets of red. Red is the most popular, densely popular. So that here we've got high rise flats and old terrace housing. Here you've got quite affluent, uh, where millionaires live. It's quite a mixed city, Chester. It's got here, we have in the bottom 1% of deprivation indexes. Over here, uh, um, out, in, out here, we've got in the top 1% of wealth. And that is, uh, Chester is a tale of two cities. It, it really is uh, an interesting place, because it is rich and poor side by side. Um, we can see the densely populated areas, high-rise flats here, leafy suburbs. Um, how does that data look as a table? Here we are. I don't know if you can see that well enough, but that's a postcode. And then, so if I just take that CH14BA, which happens to be the university's postcode, within one kilometre radius, the, the uh, Household density, that's household, I've done both household and population, is 17.24 households per hectare. Whereas right closer to it, 100 metres, is 12.41. So it's more densely populated <coughs> in terms of households the further you get out. That is a bit of a, because it's a university campus, there aren't many people live there. So um, it's it's put, they're pulling in a few, whereas in some of the other nearby postcodes, which are residential, you'll see the, um, the numbers. So it's, it's useful to have the different measures, 100, 250, 500, 1 kilometer, because you can tell from by comparing them, is something near the center of a city? Is it on the fringe? How far out are you? Because you, you, as you go further out, you lock your, this one's going to diminish. So you can actually see the pattern. So this is quite useful for sort of environmental analysis. What kind of neighborhood is this? Is this an inner city? Is it a leafy suburb? Is it a small town? Um, the, the, um, in, in the ONSPD, the Office of National Statistics, have a number of area definitions, but I've gone far beyond that. I've created sort of about 100 area definitions and uh, around housing type, which is much more granular for the kinds of analysis we're doing. Um, this is just another example. This is uh, Wirral. This is population density. Um, so again, red. So what we're seeing here is that uh, we've got the um, 
densely populated high rise and old communities um, and then you've got quite affluent football I mean this area here is where all the footballers live so I mean it's quite leafy and one thing here is if you're doing any kind of radial analysis make sure you dis uh, exclude any area that's in the sea and you can do that again with open data because you can just um, take uh, the Ordnance Survey um, coastal uh, data set, the coastline, and you can just use that as an exclusion. So again, that data is there to help you so you know what's outside, so you just ignore that area. So you're only actually calculating the household the population density on the area that is land. Um, we were talking earlier, a couple of previous speakers have talked about the prescription data. Now, the way that's published is every prescription is anonymised. However, it does have the drug. And the NHS uh, drug codes are a hierarchy. So the first two digits is the part of the body it affects, and then the subclasses. So I think it's a 10 or 12 digit number. Uh, but you can work, so just using part of it, and I was just using the first four digits. I got all antidepressants. So what I did was that for the same area, I grabbed all the antidepressants uh, prescribed in a month. And then I divided that by the size of the list for the GP surgery. So these are GP surgeries. Red prescribed the most, green prescribed the least. So. I just wanted to see if there was a correlation between uh, poverty and antidepressant anti prescription. It's not as pronounced as I thought it would be, because some of the more deprived areas seem to have less for some reason. It seems to be very, a very mixed pattern. But nonetheless, um, I was quite interested in, in looking how it works. And I've done similar with statins as well, um, and tried to sort of assign some rough territories to GP, because you've only got a point. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Could, could you map the uh, Pinot Grigio sales? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, if Customs and Excise release their um, uh, data on alcohol sales, then we might. <coughs> Um, this is just another example of where I've aggregated data. This is the police crime data, which is given as a point. And I've done it around postcode centroids, and I've gone 500 metres aggregated the crime. Essentially, you've got a lot of crime in the middle of Chester there. That's because it's around the pub and the shops. It's where the majority of crime. But then you can find some residential neighbourhoods. I mean, again, that was the area called Lake, which is very deprived in the bottom 1%. Not surprisingly, a lot of crime. Similarly, this is a very poor estate, um, and you've got some quite affluent suburbs. But there are some little pockets of crime, out in, even in some of these little villages, which is quite surprising. Um, but is that proportionally worked out as well to the population density of each area? No, that, that is just crime. That's just raw crimes because there are other factors then. The second stage of that is to look at the makeup of that area. So businesses, is, are there any pubs? Which, um, uh, what kind of businesses are there? Uh, the business data is only at, at output area level, I'm afraid, uh, in open data. You can just know the proportion of an output area that's taken up with uh, businesses. Um, and business rates, you can, you can I mean, there's a bit of an odd thing in the anomaly of open data is that the valuation office agency on their T's and C's at the bottom say this data and the contents of this website are open data if you go and look at a council tax band or valuation office but then they say you can't scrape it as well somewhere else so uh, and they don't publish it as a bulk download so it's kind of a contradiction however in, if you're just doing a small area you can do a few you can look up a, a postcode uh, it will let you look up a postcode sector and you'll get all the properties back in that postcode sector and you can just grab the screen. Um, you can just drop the screen, uh, cut and paste the screen into Excel, which is what I've done in a couple of cases. So you can actually find where businesses are, their actual address. Um, yes, it's then looking at, because the reason for doing this uh, was to look at the 
underlying causes, and then by your makeup, by what, how densely populated. Because actually, if you start dividing by population, it 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 came very flat. Actually, apart from the city centre, it then highlights areas here. Nobody nobody lives here. It's business, it's shops and pubs. Uh, and the, uh, the railway station seems to have a lot of crime. To real, uh, it's probably because of the type of area. But, uh, yeah. And these, I'll finish off on the Inspire Directive. Um, there's a lot more reading. The Inspire Directive is an EU directive. It's called the Infrastructure for Spatial Information in Europe. And it's an EU directive since May 2007. It lays down a framework for member states to publish spatial uh, geographic information. Uh, the aim is to ensure compatibility and usability across member states so that standards are, so you can actually join data that's published by different member states. Interoperability of spatial data sets, that's also important. So, and metadata standards, it does lay those down in the directive, although not all, they're not all complied with as they should be yet. Uh, so, an example, Ordnance Survey Open Data. In this country, is data released under the Inspire Directive. The German equivalent, the Bundesamt for Cartography, um, has very similar open data to Ordnance Survey. You can go and download boundaries, background maps. I've had a good play. Ger German open data is pretty good, uh, and it's getting better. They, Germany was very slow to get off the mark with open data. Uh, it's a country I'm working in quite a bit at the moment, uh, but they've suddenly ramped up, ramped it up fast because there's a very big, powerful political lobby to releasing more open data. And land registry cadastral polygons. Now these are a real hot topic. If you go on land registry, you can download a set of polygon files. Cadastral is the French word for, French word for taxing, I think, but it's actually land boundaries. And so you can download a, a set of land boundaries at local authority level, so it's every piece of land on the land registry, the boundary of it, and you've got what's called the Inspire ID, so that because land registry has its own internal reference, but they want this to work across Europe, is that every land uh, piece of land registered in the UK also has an Inspire ID, which is a European ID as well as its local local ID. But there's a dispute going on because land registry published this as open data. Ordnance Survey turned around and said, "Hang on a minute, there are." There are coordinates you've got in there, and is what Jackie was saying earlier. Some of the OS products are premium products. They're things they don't want to sell. They make a lot of money out of them. They're very granular details. So there's a big dispute going. Although you can get them, there are now some restrictions on usage, particularly commercial usage. You know, I think they're just restricted to personal use at the moment, personal and academic use at the moment. Um, but that's what they look like, that's the cadastral polygon, that's actually the University of Chester. Uh, there's a hole in it there, because uh, a polygon can have a hole in it. And that's, a, that's because there's a house on the campus, however the university owns the pathway around it. <laughs> uh, it uh, a polygon, it actually just technically, a polygon is a set of linked points. And it, it's stored clockwise, always. Except a hole, so you know it's a hole, is anti-clockwise. That's how the software knows. So if you, you can have a set of concentric rings in a polygon, which are, so if you like had um, a piece of land with a lake, with an island in the middle, we, you'd have uh, an outer ring, then you'd have a hole, and then you'd have the island, which is a piece of land. So you'd have, um, that's quite an interesting example I like to give. So sorry I've gone on slightly longer than expected, but uh, any questions? Okay, that was amazing. <laughs> We have got some flexibility on the time. We are about 15 minutes over, so I think we could probably take a bit of a, a choice now. Do questions and discussion now, or 
allow Dominic to come up and then have the group discussion afterwards. Any burning questions on this topic? Anything now? Yeah. I suppose the one thing you didn't mention is PATH. <laughs> PATH, yeah, it's not open data. Yeah. 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 Which, I mean, you using a couple of polygons is good, I mean, yeah. for limits, but yeah. you know, you have a lot of problems with the size of the postcodes, yeah, especially when you start getting into vertical streets. Mm. Um, so most people who maybe just for their business need to take it, and you've got that problem of correlation isn't causality. Yeah. Um, Don't go yeah. to the bar. No, it, it, is, it, is, it, is a, it is a weakness, yeah. I, I mean, there is actually a code point with Polygon's data set, but the, the Ordnance Survey, that the ODUG has put pressure on Ordnance Survey to release that as open data. Now, code point with Polygon would solve that issue, although it wouldn't give you the path, it would show you the extent of the postcodes. Um, the, the, the thing I've done with that is what's called Veronoi polygons, where you actually take point and you, you find the boundaries between points and you sort of approximate it. It's not quite right, but it's okay for, if you're representing quite a large area, it's okay. It does give you a rough approximation of the area of the postcode. But generally, if you've got vertical streets, you'll find your postcode centroids are very close together. So, so we know from those very dense red spots that I gave you, there are block, several blocks of flats that are very close together, probably with a, uh, 100, and 100 flats in each block uh, in a very small area, so your population density is very high. So, so we, it, it, I do work a bit around how close together the, the, they are as well. But, I, I suppose from my background is I started yeah. addressing, and I was very rural, so we get very funny shaped postcodes, yes. where we actually had one which was a split. Yeah. So the centroid was right down here, there were two houses right off the forest street somewhere else. So it's mm -hmm. just, I suppose with a bit of a warning, it's great as open data, yeah. but you have to still be very careful with the uh, assumptions you make out of your matching. Well, in the day job, we do use PATH because we're a licensed PATH and OS reseller, but the, that that's, uh, clients have to pay for that or have an existing license themselves. Um, there, there are a few things. Uh, I mean, one thing, certainly postcode sectors, um, I've, I've approximate, I think some of you probably know Robert Barr as well, uh, um, he's done similar, approximated them using output area boundaries by, by sort of just aggregating together output areas and postcode sectors. It gives you a rough approximation. It's certainly good enough for, for, for sort of visual mapping of the, of the UK. Um, you can also do that with postcode areas and districts. You can make them. So there's freely available open data that you can aggregate with ONSPD to get a rough shape. Um, aside from that, uh, I think that's really all we can do with open data. Okay, thank you very much.